see the pastoral tool and depot, they're old school, they bring their children right to church. <laughs> That's the way Dr. Stevens uh, encouraged us all. So uh, it's a real blessing to be here. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come into this sanctuary and we can come in and be amongst the body of Christ here. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided this haven for us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can uh, hear your words, Lord, tonight. Uh, they are your words. We pray that and know that you will anoint them. And we ask that you would really bless the people, Lord, here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this evening, uh, I've got some like thoughts on love. And uh, Pastor Schaller uh, recently... Uh, did a message on uh, uh, that the needs of man, and I think it was repeated by Pastor Chevelli, that uh, that man needs to love and to be loved. Sometimes people will say, like, what are the people of China like? And you can say, well, they need to be loved and they need to love. And uh, what are the people in uh, New Zealand like? Well, they need to be loved and they need to be, uh, you know, <laughs> They need to love and they need to be loved. And it's the same way here in India. And I was, uh, listen, I was always uh, quite interested about uh, horse therapy. Have you ever heard that before? Horse therapy. Have you? I mean, yeah, he's well read. <laughs> anyway, there's an amazing thing about horses. That horses have a high therapeutic value. I noticed that in the business I had, I had individuals that were uh, suffering from fibromyalgia. One individual could barely walk up the stairs. And he told me that uh, he gets total relief from riding horses. And uh, I said, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it because he could barely walk. He was like racked with pain. And fibromyalgia is a terrible disease. And, uh, but yet individuals say that when they ride on a horse, they are totally okay, uh, uh, cured. There's just something about horses, if you will. But this story, this message is not about horses, but it's about, <laughs> it's about uh, love. And it's a story about a, a boy and his horse. And I was listening uh, to the radio, the Christian radio in uh, Baltimore, and they're telling the story about uh, a man that, a young man who had went through many, many uh, delinquent centers. Uh, he had been in and out of trouble. Uh, he wouldn't respond to anything, uh, not to counselors, not Christian counselors. Nothing okay would cause response. And this young man was maybe 15, 16 years old and really on his way to a life in prison. And uh, people had just about given up on him. But this whole home that he was in, uh, they were invited to come to this uh, uh, a farm where you could ride horses and different things like that. And each one of the children that they were, they were challenged in different ways, but this young man was the most challenged. And uh, so they uh, brought the group of uh, uh, individuals there and uh, all of them, okay, were responding, enjoying themselves, having a great day, riding horses, loving horses, and that type of thing. But they noticed where was this young man? They didn't know where he was. So they just assumed that he had ran off, and sooner or later he would be caught, and he would be back in the system. But as the time went on, they, they started worrying about him, and they looked behind the barn. And keep in mind, okay, these horses, that they get them very inexpensive because uh, they've been abused, or they're old race horses, and they've been neglected. Uh, but in back of the barn was this one horse that was like totally abused, totally shut down, and didn't respond to any of the individuals at all. And there was that young boy. And that young boy was talking to the horse being with the horse, and the horse was responding. And, uh, and the end of the story is very good. After that day, that boy's life was changed. He responded to the Word of God, he responded to initiation, and he went on not to be in the, not to be in the system anymore. And it's a story about 
that people need to be loved and they need to love. And, uh, and that's an amazing thing about the gospel. Uh, I believe 538 times in the New Testament the word love is mentioned. And uh, you know, we see that the word love is mentioned so many times in the Gospel of John. And uh, John was, uh, his job as a fisherman, he was a mender of nets. In other words, okay, he was not the, the boatsman, he was not, okay, the aggressive man that Peter was, but he was the mender, he was the healer. And, uh, and it does, it kind of fits right into place with, okay, his occupation, if you will, that, that he talks so much about love because love, okay, is healing. Uh, this weekend I went to, a, I had an opportunity to go to a banquet and there was a number of people there and I'm very, very thankful that I went there. But it was a, it was a, um, it was a, a, a whole uh, award seminar of, uh, you know, how to combat terrorism. And people have different, different ideas. The ex-president of Afghanistan was there. A lot of individuals were there. And they had all different ideas, but uh, Ravi Zachariah was there. And then, you know, I'll tell you what, he was like, I had never listened to him speak in person. And he was the one that, gave, that really showed compassion to the person that was, gonna, was being awarded. I don't know if you remember or not, in Bangladesh there was a, there was a, a terrorist attack about two years ago. There were uh, two Americans and there was uh, one Bangladesh man, young man, and he was uh, actually studying in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, University in America and he brought two of his friends to Bangladesh. And uh, uh, when the terrorists took over, they demanded, okay, that if everyone had to recite a certain thing in the Quran, it would be like to bust John 3.16 that all, you know, evangelicals would know. Well, those two girls didn't know it because they weren't Muslims. But the friend that invited them decided, okay, to, uh, to refuse to quote that Quran. And as a result, okay, that he was killed and the two other girls were killed. His mother received a re award, uh, the Mother Teresa Award, in honor of her son that really kind of gave his life for those two two individuals. I had the opportunity, not that I'm anything, but God moved down upon my heart to after the award seminar to go up to the mother and really talk with her. And I could relate very, very well to her. And I also told her about, you know, God's love and his compassion, that he is the one that can fill the void. But even before that, Rabbi Zachariah he was the one main speaker, and there's lots of speakers. There was generals and presidents and this and that. I had never been in a thing like that before, to be honest with you. Know, I guess blessing by association, but, but nonetheless, that he was the one that showed compassion. And then he delivered a message about, uh, about the love of God. And he delivered a message that, that God's love was incarnated in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that love is the thing that we need that transforms lives. And uh, it, was not, it was a great message, but I wanted to just to kind of wrap it up by saying that love was before time. Love was revealed at salvation. And love transforms the people's lives. And, uh, you know, it, in 1 John 4, 4 verse 8, it says, uh, that God is love. It's not that God became love, He was love. And in Acts 2.23, it was way before the foundation of the, of, the, of the world that God in His foredetermined counsel, and what does that mean? That means that the Trinity got together and planned a way on how you and the whole world could be loved by God. And they planned it. Father was a planner, the Son executed it, and the Holy Spirit revealed it. And what do I mean by that? That they had purpose that the only way that people could receive love is if Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. Being the ram in the thicket, if you will. And Ravi said that, you know, sons do not need to die anymore because, okay, 
because of uh, because Jesus Christ is the ram in the thicket. And I was thinking that you know we read in the Old Testament that many times people gave up you know their 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 sons uh, and sacrificed them, and we think how cruel and it's crazy and everything. But why? I think that they were doing it trying to create an expiation, a sacrifice, because children sin less. They are born sinners, but they sin less. So they offered what they could. But uh, the, our sons did not have to be offered in war anymore because Jesus, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And He offered up His Son. And to as many as believe upon Him, their lives are changed. The world doesn't need education, it doesn't need schemes and programs, it needs Christ, doesn't it? So, uh, that, that was God's plan, and God is free to love us because the justice of God has been, sat, been satisfied on Calvary. And that was God's plan. And secondly, that lo love is revealed in salvation. And you can read this in Ezekiel chapter 16, 1 through 8, that it was a common practice to leave the unwanted children in the field. And uh, the young children were left in the field to die. They were not washed. They were not purified. They were not swaddled. Uh, they were left with no pity. And, uh, but what did God say? And we're saying, okay, that here, that we, we were born and we were like orphans, if you will, okay, orphaned and separated from God, but God, because of His great love, He has adopted us. And uh, I said, uh, what did God do? God, God said, live to those children, and that it is a time of love. <clears throat> and they were, <clears throat> they were covered by the love of God, they were adopted by God, they were washed. That's what you do with a baby, you wash the baby. And the moment that we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we were washed today with the waters of regeneration. In Titus 3, 5, and we, they were anointed. Uh, they were anointed with oil. And the moment we believe we're a, that the Holy Spirit comes in their life. And they were not left, okay, unswaddled. Swaddling, you probably know about it just as good as I, but it means like wrapping of a baby in tight so that it cannot move around and maybe hurt themselves but uh, that we were clothed with His righteousness. Not our own righteousness, but the moment we believed in Christ, Christ gave us His righteousness, and we were girded with linen, not of wool, that we are girded. Linen speaks of no sweat, and it speaks, okay, no irritation, and it speaks of grace and not words. And that we were made beautiful. That's what they did for that child in Ezekiel chapter 16. They made the child beautiful. Just like a deep is making the children beautiful. And uh, she's adorning them and things like that. And God makes us beautiful. Not uh, just on the outside, but on the inside in 1 Peter chapter 3. And how many times have we heard that the quiet and beautiful inward testimony of the woman in the household is finally left, led us boneheaded men to the Lord. <laughs> And uh, what God, God gives her, the beauty of a quiet and meek spirit inside. And then, okay, the child is put at a banqueting table. It's a table of grace and a table of love. It's got flour and honey. And then, uh, and then uh, so it's a beautiful picture. You can read that over Ezekiel chapter 16. In Psalm 91, verse 14, it says, He set His love upon us. God has set His love upon us, that, that we are loved by God, and that we need to, as we receive that love, then naturally flow it out. If you have a flow of water coming in and nothing going out, what do you have? You have stagnation, right? But if you have the love and the water flowing in and flowing out, then you have fresh water. And as we receive the love of God, and this is my, my personal prayer, Lord, that you would reveal uh, your love to me and that you would show me the fresh. Because I know this, that everything that comes from God is outside of ourselves. 
And I know, like, the atheists, we meet sometimes atheists, and atheists that put up walls, that they don't, they don't say, there, there's nothing okay outside of myself. You know, and I've been hurt, and I will not receive love, and they have a very, very guarded life. But the love that comes from above is the love that God desires to give us. And the love of the Holy Spirit is like no comparison on this earth. And Lord, that we have tasted, and you are good, and may we be dispensers of that to a lost and dying world. That's what changes people's lives. That's what will change, okay? young children coming into uh, Pastor Tool and Deepa's uh, uh, family, their lives will be changed by love. Amen? So, Father, we pray that you would just really uh, uh, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Love and to be loved. <clears throat> Can you love too much? Think. Can you can you love so much that someone gets upset? Of course, it's this too much, right? <clears throat> uh, I was watching the news the other day, and there's a story of this mining, the Reddy brothers, and they spent 500 crores on their daughter's wedding, 16 heavy bags, and, and so income tax people are waiting there. And you know, and people are saying, what a waste, what a waste. And I was thinking about it, yeah, I mean, you know, we look at it and say, yeah, waste. But for him, it's his daughter. And if he has the funds, what's your problem? In a way, you know, I was, it's a different type of thinking, but I was like, I mean, he wants to do it for his daughter, what do I like it? But what is the word saying, you know? Like, what a waste. Like, in these tough moments, look at this, you know? And <clears throat> John 12 is a story, right? Mary with the alabaster box. And everyone is like, <laughs> what a waste. And, and Jesus is saying, leave her alone. Leave her alone. You know, and uh, so we'll talk about that for a few minutes. If you were in Santa Cruz three weeks ago, two weeks ago, you probably heard this, but it's a little different. But who cares? But Father, we just thank you, Lord, uh, to, to love. To be loved and to love, Lord, is the greatest privilege, Father. But to be loved by God, and have the opportunity every day to love Him back and love the body as Christ has loved us, that's even a greater privilege, Father. We just pray that the purest love, the Holy Spirit's love, which the Father's love, the Son's love, is shed abroad in our hearts, Father. And not only are we partakers, but we're also sharing this love, Father. We just thank you for these moments, Father, and thank you for the word we ask you to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. <clears throat> in John 12, it's, uh, we, this story is also in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. And uh, it's interesting if you read all the three passages together, then you realize that uh, Jesus is at the home of Simon the leper. <laughs> That's why there is a plot by the chief, by the high priest and the Pharisees to kill Jesus. But in John 12, 8, uh, John 12, we also see there is a plot to kill Lazarus. They want to kill Lazarus because the dead man has risen. And because of this man's testimony, many people are turning to the Lord. So in the whole background of this plot to kill Jesus, plot to kill Lazarus, and they are at the house of Simon the leper, right? And uh, People are there, they are all come to see Mr. Lazarus. I mean, if we were to know that someone was dead and was healed and has come back to life, would we want to be around the person and ask him a few questions and say, Hey, how is it? What happened in the three days when you died? Like, what, what was the first thing that came to your mind when you came back to life? You know, all those things are going on in our mind. and. Uh, there's, there's a, if you read those three passages, there's a lot of crowds, there's a lot of people, and somehow they are seeing Lazarus, but no one's noticing in a way Jesus. He's there, but they are come to see Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus died and rose again. How about the one who brought him back to life? You know, and sometimes in life we can uh, miss like what passage. Fred was speaking about is uh, the aspect of love. 
and uh, <clears throat> because from love also comes worship. Uh, I don't think God is. Uh, how, can I worship without loving God? Superficially, I can, you know, by saying the right things. But but true worship uh, is always rooted in in this love. One, knowing that God has loved me, and two, then loving God back, you know, and with what. <clears throat> And so here, here is the whole picture right there. And uh, and they come there and they are seated. And <clears throat> in a few, I just go through a few points of what we, what I was thinking about and what we uh, see in these portions. And and the first thing that I I got from this passage was that uh, true worship, true love, true worship is uh, will cost you. True worship will cost you. It's, it's never, uh, sometimes you can think, oh, I can, you know, serving the Lord is nothing, it's not a big deal, I can do it any time. But, but I think true worship, really worshiping God, following God, loving God, uh, it involves a cost. And uh, sometimes the cost involved is time. Sometimes the cost involved is our dreams and ambitions. I want to do A, B, C in my life. And God is saying, no, but I want you to do this. And uh, the real expression of worship, the real expression of love will come when, when I say, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and here she is uh, with the ointment, with the, with the aroma, with the perfume. And she's anointing the head and the feet. And, and we see that. And uh, This, this, this spike nard that they speak about uh, was found in the Himalayan region. It was very expensive. And it says here it was worth one year's salary. So if you calculate the amount that you get on a daily basis, and it was for the whole year, and that was what that little bottle of oil cost. And uh, Mary does not hold it back. Most people would have that oil or that ointment, they would, people would call, is for their own funeral. Like it was so expensive, they would save all their lives so that it could be used at their own funeral. And here, she is not bothered about it. She just pours it upon the Lord. <clears throat> if you read, historically, I was reading some things and you know when they, why they break it, why they break the glass? When, when in the Eastern customs, when you would serve someone important in a glass, sometimes people would break it so that someone lower or lesser important than that person could not use it because it has been used by someone who was very important. So they would break it. And here she broke, there's a significance why she broke it because she didn't want that bottle to be used again. And she was like giving it all. She was like, this is the, my best is for my Lord. She had received love, so she was giving it right back. And it was, did it cost her? Yeah. It cost her everything. Maybe it was for her. And, and we joked about this the other day and we said, if I was in that place, I would have sold the bottle, given 10% to the Lord and said, see, I'm, I'm an honest Christian. 10% of the profit I gave to the Lord because the Bible says it and the remaining is with me. But there is a difference in that story because uh, she doesn't do that. She just breaks it and it's like all upon him. And uh, in the other, Matthew 26 and Mark 14, it talks about his head being anointed. In here it's the feet. And it's an interesting thing because when you're at the feet, it, is talk, it talks about surrender. It talks about humility. It's interesting because John chapter 13, Jesus would go down at the feet. And you know, there's a picture of humility and wash the feet of the disciples. And John 12 and John 13 go, out, go together very well. <clears throat> and it, this, is, this is a, it was not a waste for her. She knew that all that she had actually came from the Lord and it was going back. She, had, she was not counting the cost. She had already decided that my worship will be the best for my Lord. So whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do the best for my Lord. Remember in 2 Samuel 24, 
there is a <coughs> famine and then there is a punishment because on, on David's life because of his senses. And then he goes to build an altar. And the guy says, take the land free. And David says, I will not offer anything to the Lord that has cost me nothing. Like here he is a king, he can easily say, thank you for the land, it belongs to me anyway. You are a part of my kingdom, I own this anyway. You are giving it to me, thank you. And I will build an altar. And he says, no, no, no. You want to give it free, but if it's for the Lord, and I can't give something that has not cost me. And th this is the point that comes out here is maybe sometimes we love in a human way uh, because of acceptance, because of we get something back, because of different reasons. Uh, but here is true worship, the love that comes out, which just says, even if nothing, even if I lose everything, even if it's gone, this is for my Lord. And, and when, when, when Mary did that, she served out of love. It was totally that way. Because when we think about the book of Ephesians, I was thinking, how much has Christ done for us? Right? When you read the first three chapters, we think about how much has Christ done for us? Like it was grace is easy for us. We received it. You know? It's easy to receive grace. Is it, is it easy to give grace? We find it a little difficult, right? Sometimes to give grace, we find it a little difficult. But they don't deserve it exactly. Neither did we. <clears throat> but that's the beauty that here Mary understood that worship includes that like it, it's going to cost me. And in application, I was thinking sometimes in life, you know, we can think that we can serve God and you know the way we want it, and God is saying, "What is it costing you anything? Like, are you are you in this just because everything is going well, or is it has it cost you something?" And my mind was going back to all the people who have come, stayed in MTC and gone there. And I was thinking about some people's lives and of course all of you also, everyone included. I'm not just saying about them. But I was thinking of some people's lives who left everything, came and some of them had done Bible college already. And then they came and said, but we'll do it again. Because not because to get a degree, but because they really loved God and they really wanted to know God in His true character. And maybe they were not happy. I won't say happy, but they were not satisfied with what they knew and they wanted to know him in a deeper way. And said, so it doesn't matter. Right now I let the church be the way it is, somebody can handle it, but I'll go back and I'll, I'll get to know the Lord in a deeper way. It's going to cost me, but you know what? It's worth it. And that's that's the point number two I was thinking about. That <coughs> uh, worshipping, serving, loving God is always worth it. It's you'll never regret it. We will never regret <coughs> serving God. You know, and <coughs> Uh, the, the story of uh, the woman in the temple and Jesus is looking at her and everyone who's coming in and putting the money in the offering box and Christ is there and uh, the widow comes with two copper coins and she puts it in the and, and Jesus uh, she gave the most in human terms it doesn't make sense because it's the lowest value but in, in spiritual terms, Jesus said, because that was all that she had to live on. Once she put those two copper coins in, that was it. She had nothing. She would not know where she would get the evening meal. And Jesus said, she's put in the most. And I was, I was thinking like, <clears throat> when, when, when we worship, when we serve, when we love the Lord, uh, no, no, no cost is too high. No cost is too high. We cannot say that, I have done so much for you, Lord. Can we say, I have done so much for you, Lord. You have not done anything, actually. And, and, the, and the widow just put two copper coins in. Was anyone noticing? Was she asking for anything? No. And Jesus said, but she is the one who gives the most. And in this story, uh, the disciples are grumbling murmuring, uh, Judas is acting concerned, but he's not, right? He's thinking, oh, but we could have fed so many orphans and poor people. And others are looking at him, oh, what a heart he has. Yeah, he had a wicked heart, so <clears throat> really what a heart he had. Because his Savior is right in front of him and he never accepted him. For three years he walked with his Savior. He knew once if he had believed upon him, he could have been saved, but he did not. So what a heart. But this is selfless. This is like 
there is no regret. Imagine, imagine being in the room and everyone is murmuring and complaining. And we, of course we blame Judas. But if you read Mark 14, you will say, it says the disciples were also indignant, which means they were furious. They were upset at her worship. Somehow I think she was more connected to Jesus than the other 11. Like she understood Christ more than they did. Because she was not bothered about what people were saying or thinking, but they were indignant, it says in Mark 14. They were really upset. Why is she doing this? Oh, what a waste. And uh, she's not bothered about crumbling. She's not bothered about critics. She's not bothered about eyes looking upon her. Because sometimes when we are serving and worshipping Lord, and sometimes people can make things think, oh, you serving God at this age. You're doing this. I'll take care of your life. Your family is there. Your future. What about it? And we are like, sometimes those things, when you hear those things, they can pull you down. And you're like, am I really like neglecting my whole family and my life? And you know, is is this worth it? Is 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 Jesus going to be upset at me? What about my family? Are they going to be like you know what what? And then the idea is, hey, listen, when you really worship, you will never regret it. When you really worship the Lord, when you really serve the Lord, you will never regret it. It's it's never a waste. It's never going to go down the drain in a way. And she understood that aspect. And she's saying, oh, let the disciples complain. Let them murmur. Let them point fingers at me. Let them look at me in a funny way. Let them criticize me. But my eyes are focused on the Lord. You know what she did? Everyone who had come to see Lazarus, and she was looking at Jesus, and she said, you should not be looking there. Of course, the testimony is good, but let's think about the healer. He's right here. Let's be occupied with God and not with what He did. <clears throat> Psalm 103, remember the verse that Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. Right? They knew, oh, God can bring down water, God can bring manna. And Moses says, I know the way God operates. So when God said, I will destroy this nation, and He said, no, Lord, but you are loving kindness. You are gracious, you are merciful. He knew His ways. And we think about it, when we read, when we read uh, missionary stories, when we read church history, when we read those things, we see many of these lives that people would say, what a waste, but it was not, right? Like you see, you think of Jim Elliot's life and young men and going to Ecuador and those Oka Indian tribes and people are, <coughs> they go there and they get murdered. And people are saying, ah, what a waste, what a waste. But was their life a waste? Uh, we, we read this story about, uh, you know, and many many of them, like CD started at 55. And the church is saying no, and the missions board is saying no, and his wife is saying no, but at 85 he's there. You know, uh, William Borden's story, remember those words? No retreat, no regrets, no reserves. You know the real story? It was, those three words were not written at one point in time. When he was 16 years old and he graduated, and because he was a brilliant student, his family said, here is a ticket, go all over the world. And he said, no, I have decided to live my life for Jesus. So I'm, I, I don't, I'm not interested in traveling the whole world. And that moment he wrote, he, he wrote in his <coughs> Bible, no reserves, I'm not doing anything. Then when he passed out, and then when he was given the opportunity to become the heir of the whole family empire, then he said, no, but I'm going to go to missions. He went to university. Everyone in the university knew that this guy is brilliant. He can, but he won't. He will probably do something for the Lord. And that's when he wrote in his Bible, when he got, got out and he got the opportunity, he said, no retreat. And then when he took a ship, he wanted to go to India, via India, to China, he reached Egypt, got meningitis and, and died. And before that, he wrote, no regrets. It was over a period of time he wrote those three things. Because that is what God was doing in his life. And he could say no to the brilliant career. He could say no to the brilliant inheritance that he had. He could say no to all the world that offered him. And people would say, 22 years old and dead, what's the use? What's the use? The life is wasted. Running after Jesus and 22 and so much money on one side. So much great future and at 22 you're dead under the ground. What's the use? Life is wasted. And But we know the story, right? Hundred of hundred more missionaries came to India just because of one man's life. And we can take names, we can talk about Alexander McKay, we can talk about Jim Pate, we can talk about all these men. 
and many of them, like William Carey and all those people, 30 years and five, seven converts, so many years and two converts, and so many this and this much results. But I don't think any one of them focused on the result. They were focused on Jesus. And once they passed away, then the real fruit was revealed. And sometimes that's our life. You may not see a lot of results happening, but who cares? We are not here for results. We are here for the Lord. And when worship happens, when true worship happens, it's never a waste. You may be cleaning uh, in the dorms, in your rooms, or the bathrooms. Who cares? It's not a waste. It's not a waste. You may clean chairs. You may run around doing little works. Who cares? It's not a waste. It's not how much. It's how. And I think Mary here is looking at all those things, but she's not bothered about the disciples. <coughs> she's not bothered about their talk. She's like, here he is. Her life is a sweet smelling aroma. Her life was not wasted. Judas's life was a waste. Right? <coughs> and this is like, there was, it says the whole room was filled with the fragrance. Well, I was thinking about a whole room filled with the fragrance means what? It means, and I thought about it, it means like the fruit of the Spirit being revealed in my life. The fruit of the Spirit being, which means if I'm in a room and the conversation is going on or we are having a good time talking, fellowshipping, whatever we are doing, and someone is saying, it's good that there so and so is in the room. <clears throat> like even if 50 of us are sitting in a room and pastors there talking, you walk out of the room saying, it's good, to, it's good to be around him. It's good to be around him. Why? Because something is being revealed to us. You know, something is being revealed to us. And the whole room, as it says, the whole room was filled with this fragrance. Was filled with the fragrance. And that's our lives, you know, when we serve, when we truly worship, then, then the effect is not only on us, but it, it spreads. Your life becomes that fragrance. Your life becomes that aroma, right? And uh, Abraham never spoke to anyone, right? When he took his son in Genesis 22. He never spoke to his family, he never spoke to anyone, and he just said, he took his servants, and what did he say? He says, we will go up and what? Worship the Lord. And then we'll come back together. He did not say, I will come back. He said, we will come back. And he knew that what he was going to do was never going to be a waste or even something that he will regret. He knew that even though it cost him, God will bring out the sweet smelling aroma out of the whole thing. And it did. Post Genesis 22, we call him the father of our faith. It was never going to be a waste. Like Abraham knew in his heart, but I love, and I really love God and worship him never be a waste. Third, I was thinking of is that this worship will always lead to some kind of action. <clears throat> I cannot say that I love God, worship God and then not do anything and just be like, you know, uh, worship, real love, true love will always take a step of faith. Because Jesus loved us, that's why he went to the cross. He didn't go to the cross first and then loved us. It's a big difference in our understanding. Because he loved us, because God is love, that's why he went to the cross. And love takes steps of faith. Love takes steps. Love leads to action. True worship will always lead to some kind of action. <clears throat> we see Mary three times in the Bible, right? We see her in Luke 10, John 11, and John 12. And all three places you see her at the feet of Christ. So how do I serve God? When I worship God, how do I serve Him? Where is the first place you see her? Luke 10. What is she doing? Receive, receiving the Word. And that's, that's the pattern. In John 11, when Jesus comes and Lazarus is dead, she falls at his feet. And here again she's at the feet worshipping, serving. 
and that's that's the illustration for lives. Before you serve, you need to worship. If you if you serve without worshiping, if you serve without loving, it will lead to emptiness. You will never have contentment. You will never be satisfied because you worked, you did something, but the motivation was not love. And that's where that linen garments that Pastor Fred talked about makes sense because linen garments perhaps spoke about no work, but spoke about grace. The high priest would wear that. Priest would wear linen because it was it was showing and revealing that it's not about you. Your works cannot take you to heaven. It's the grace of God. So you need that grace. And here, when she does that, she shows us the pattern. God put that pattern in. First, you hear the word, then you serve. First, you worship, then you serve. If you got it upside down, then everything will be upside down. If you serve and then you go and worship, it won't work. Then you will feel empty, you will feel like uh, not satisfied, discontent. Uh, sometimes you will, you will measure yourself, not like size-wise, but am I doing enough? Is this good enough? Because you know why? Your, your service is coming out yourself and not about from the, from the heart of worship. Because you look, look at the people that are sitting there. Lazarus raised from the dead. Is he worshipping? No, he's just sitting. It's good, but he's there. Simon the leper. It's in his house. What's he doing? They're all talking, having a good time. It's Jesus is in the house. Eleven disciples are there. Right? Uh, the Martha is there. Uh, Judas is there. The Jews who have come to see uh, Lazarus raised from the dead are there. But who's the only one who's doing something? It's Mary. She understood love. And because she understood love, she had heard. She was anointing his body before the body. Like she was saying, I believe what you have said. In six days before the Passover, you said you're going to go up, which means you're going to die, you're going to be buried. I don't know if I'll get a chance to anoint your body before the burial, so I'm going to do it now. Because I don't know if I'll get the chance then. She was she had been, she had heard the word so much, she knew exactly what was going to happen, so she was anointing. Were the disciples doing it? No. But she was. Why? Because she sat, she took time, and in spite of her sister criticizing her, she wanted to be in a better place to hear the word. And sometimes if, if that's that's the illustration basically. If service comes before love and worship and hearing the word, Martha. If service comes after worship, loving the word, then Mary. We choose. Both the illustrations are kept there for us to learn. And <clears throat> love and true worship will always lead us into some kind of action. And if you look at the Great Commission passages, they all say one word, go. They don't say the word stay. It's all speaking about action. It means do something about it. Do something. And uh, finally, uh, we serve him while we have the opportunity. So, so true worship and love will cost us. Yes, it will. Secondly, it's never a waste. We won't regret it. Third, first comes worship, then comes service. So we serve. And fourth, we serve him while we have the time and opportunity. And we have the time and opportunity now. Right? Uh, many passages in the Bible use the writers will begin with the word now, there is no condemnation. Now, now, they will use this word now. And the reason they use now is because they're speaking in the present affirmative, which means simply saying that it's, it's the time now. This is the opportunity, move, do something. And we, 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 we are saying to ourselves like, Lord, now, I feel, a pri not to say boast, not to, not to boast, but I feel privileged that when I came, when I became a Christian, I was put, someone brought me straight to greater grace. At that point of time, I did not realize the value. But years down the line, I realized the value. Because no signs and wonders, no miracle thinking. I'm not saying those things are bad. What I'm trying to say is the focus was always on doctrine. And it kind of irritated me initially because, you know, come on, can't we talk anything else? 
we are always talking, you know, wherever we sit to eat, we want to talk about the Bible. I want to get to know you, but sooner or later you come back to the Bible. So it used to, initially I was actually a little irritated, like, why every time they want to... So you get to ask questions. When I would ask a question, they would open the Bible again. So I was like, why? Again, if you ask a simple question also, they would have given me the answer from the Bible. And there was a reason, I, mean, I never understood that initially. But later on it began to dawn, like, okay. There is a reason behind all this. And what I loved initially about the ministry was everyone was doing something. Whoever I met, whoever I was with, they were doing something. Pastor Roshan and Pastor Bean used to follow up on me. So imagine how bad I was. That they had to send Pastor Roshan and Pastor Bean to follow up upon me. Like, Make sure he's there for the next Sunday service. So, <clears throat> but it was a fun time. And uh, they always came and encouraged. But I thought about it like, Everyone was doing something. And uh, when we love God, when we uh, want to serve Him, uh, we don't wait for opportunities to come. We create the opportunity. Like, I don't want to wait for someone to come and ask me, can you help? Can you volunteer? I'm like, I go up to the person and say, hey, is there something I can do? Can I do this? Can I do that? Like, I'm not sitting back waiting. Come on, please, come on. Someone come to me. Someone come to me and ask me, I've been waiting to serve. And he's like, no. Imagine if Jesus had to wait till everyone loved him. <clears throat> but true love will always seize the opportunity and take, take a step. Uh, wherever we may be, wherever we are, you know, I'm speaking in a room where all disciples are, so it's difficult to say anything more. But the idea is this, like, now is the time. This is the moments that we want to focus on. These are the times. Like I don't want to plan so much of my life one year down the line that this is what I will do five years from now and miss the opportunity to serve God tomorrow morning. Because tomorrow morning I can be presented with an opportunity to serve or to share the word with someone. And I don't want to be so occupied with five years down the line that I forget tomorrow morning. And it means basically it's like these are the moments to pray. These are the times when we can pray. Uh, December coming up, many churches. I mean, think about I was reading Pastor Aviram's email about his Christmas program and I was thinking, man, this guy is going to do all this, all this thinking he's doing in, in one place. And I was like, we need to pray. And the other churches everyone is doing, and these are my opportunities to pray. Maybe I'm not in Lucknow or Bhutan or all those places, but I can be using my time to pray. These are my times to go out so these are my times to love someone, encourage someone, edify someone, serve someone. And uh, as the Lord leads, and I want to always remember, it needs to flow out of that love. It needs to flow out in the love that God has loved me. And my love, my serving becomes an expression of loving God back. It's not an expression of trying to see show, but it becomes an expression of loving God back. When I'm loving him by serving others, you know, and uh, that isn't that what soul winning is all about? Is I'm loving God, I love Him so much that I can't stop but tell someone else, and I need to share. You know. So when we think of the story, <coughs> in, 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 in Jesus said, whatever she has done, wherever the gospel is preached, um, this this story will be spoken about. It was not said about Peter. Paul, John, any of his apostles, once were about anyone else, we will say about her. And there is a reason for that. It's because that's what true love, true worship does. It's a memorial to the Lord. It's, it's, it's a memorial. We are doing this because we love Him. Out of our love comes this service. Out of our love comes a motivation and a desire to serve the Lord. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the words, <clears throat> the desire to love, the desire to be loved by you. And we just want to thank you for those times, God. In these moments, Lord, we just want to think about not ourselves, God, but what you have desired, what you have planned for us. The opportunities and the moments of worship that you will give us to serve you. And so we want to thank you, God. Thank you for what we have heard today. Speak to our hearts, minister to us. Lord, that we will serve you out of 
love and not about the need but because of the way you have loved us. Thank you for this night. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.